Thank you for joining the McCain Institute's Authors and Insights book series, a series of discussions with authors of important, newly released books on American politics, policy, and leadership. My husband fought his whole life to promote American values and character-driven leadership, and it's vitally important today to carry that legacy forward by any means necessary. Today's installment, How the Great Power Competition is Shaping the 21st Century, will feature Josh Rogan, a Washington Post foreign policy columnist and CNN political analyst. He will be talking about his new book, Chaos Under Heaven, with McCain Institute Executive Director Mark Green. Thank you, Josh, for joining us today, and we hope everyone enjoys what I'm sure will be an insightful conversation. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, thank you, Cindy, for that great introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Mark Green, and uh, I want to welcome you to another installment of Authors and Insights produced by the McCain Institute. In this series, as, as Cindy said, we talk with prominent authors of new books on American politics, policy, and leadership to reaffirm the importance of character-driven leadership here at home and around the world. Today, we're joined by Josh Rogan, author of the brand new book, Chaos Under Heaven, Trump, Xi, and the Battle for the 21st Century. So Josh Rogan, of course, is well known in foreign policy circles here in Washington and in most places in the world. These days, he's a columnist at the Washington Post, and he also lends his political analysis to CNN. Over the years, you've seen his byline in publications like Bloomberg View, Newsweek, The Daily Beast, Foreign Policy Magazine, and Congressional Quarterly. He lives here in Washington, D.C. with his wife, Ali, who became a published author herself a full six months before him. We won't ask him how competitive things are at home. As always, uh, I'll get the conversation going with Josh, but we'll save plenty of time for audience questions. So please submit those questions as we go using the Zoom Q&A function, and I'll make sure that we get to them. So uh, first, Josh, uh, you've been writing on and off on foreign policy for some years now, and yet this is your first book. Uh, foreign policy is a pretty target-rich environment. Why this book, and why now? Thank you so much, Ambassador Green, and thank you, Mrs. McCain, and thanks to the McCain Institute for hosting me. I'm going to get your question in a second, I promise. I just want to quickly mention the late Senator John McCain, who had a big impact in my uh professional and intellectual uh, development over the years through his example. And of course, you know, Ambassador Green, you and I first met on one of the many trips that John McCain uh, led to the Munich Security Conference uh, so many years ago uh, in his mission to bring along a, a new generation of foreign policy uh, experts and introduce them to the world and introduce the world to them. And uh, that example lives today in your fine work and in the McCain Institute's fine work. Uh, there is one mention of John McCain in the book in the epilogue. I, I, I note that Mc, Senator McCain always quoted Mao Zedong as saying, quote, uh, he would always say, uh, uh, it's always darkest before it goes completely back black. Now, the funny thing is McCain, um, Mao Zedong never said that. And Senator McCain knew that. And he didn't like the idea of quoting Mao Zedong, but he loved the idea of misquoting him. Right? And that, that was used in my book as an example of where, uh, as an illustration of where we are in the US-China relationship, especially at the end of the Trump administration. In essence, it's, it, the book traces uh, the Trump administration's four years of uh, strategy toward China and the relationship between the two countries, but also the battle inside of the US government. And you know, when you talk about why did I choose that topic for my first book, well, you know, uh, when I started reporting for the Asahi Shinbun Japanese newspaper in 2003, uh, that was, you know, at, at a point where uh, already I saw a lot of uh, uh, changes in the way that Washington was viewing this sort of grand bargain, grand bet that we had made, uh, which roughly sums, sums up as, and I'm boiling it down a bit to be sure, uh, that if we had open engagement and encouraged China economically and integrated it into our systems as much as possible, uh, eventually China would 
uh, liberalize economically, and that would lead to it liberalizing politically, and that would in turn solve most of our other problems, and we would live in peace and coexistence. And you know, some uh, you know uh, China hands at the time believed that that was the only responsible course of action, and some China hands at the time believed that was foolhardy, and some believed that China just decided to go another way, and some still believe that that's the only responsible course of action now. But what I grew up in in this town in Washington uh, w- w- was a generation of younger experts and not necessarily China hand. And, uh, you know, because the China issue started to touch every other aspect of foreign policy and also public life. And, you know, as the younger generation sort of came into its own, we realized that this sort of uh, a narrow focus of the U.S.-China relations uh, you know, by the China hands and the sort of idea that uh, you know, this, this relationship should be managed by this small group of people wasn't really working out the way that we thought. So, you know, not being a, a China hand myself, just being a journalist, I thought it might be good to write a book that was for the non-China hands, the rest of the people, the rest of the Americans, the rest of the world. So, you know, it's, it's, it's necessarily going to be true that, of course, a lot of people in the U.S., in the China watching community have been tracing these issues for a long time. But for the rest of the country and for a lot of regular Americans in a lot of sectors of American society, they had these awakenings. That's what I'm talking about. And uh, I, in the Trump administration, that was sped up uh, incredibly for a lot of important, uh, some obvious, not so obvious reasons. And uh, we had uh, sort of real debates over how to deal with a rising China that was clearly becoming more problematic in academia and on Wall Street and in Silicon Valley and in Hollywood, uh, really in, in a robust way for often for the first time. And when the national security community and the law enforcement community in Washington, especially for the Trump administration, started interacting with those sectors, it didn't always go well for a lot of interesting reasons. And so that's what I was trying to document. That's what the chaos was. It was all of these different parts of American society trying to honestly grapple with this very complex and challenging issue of a rising China run by a a, a regime that was uh, acting in ways that were both internally repressive and externally aggressive. And trying to figure that out in an environment in the Trump administration that was frankly very chaotic and dysfunctional and some good things happened and some bad things happened. And it's not a pro-Trump book, it's not an anti-Trump book, Um, but it sort of seeks to document as best I could the the convergence of these trends, the rising China, uh, the rising populism and nationalism around the world, the rise of new foundational technologies that change the way that we interact all colliding with the Trump presidency and then colliding with the pandemic, but we can get to that a little bit later. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting, Josh, and you and I were talking about off the air. Uh, more than any book I think I've read, uh, the prologue and the epilogue are extremely important in this book. Thank you. Because the prologue sort of sets the table and the framework m- more than just in passing. I think it actually does it in, in pretty great depth. And then the epilogue naturally sort of looks forward. And I, and there's a particular piece of the epilogue I want to get to. But uh, in the prologue, you actually have a section called Awakenings. And, and you write that virtually everyone I interviewed for this book had an awakening story, a moment in their personal or professional lives when they realized that the grand strategic competition between the US and China was the most important foreign policy issue in the world and the most important project they would work on in their lifetime. And just as sort of as you uh, alluded to, that's not simply true in sort of the, you know, the inner halls, inner workings of of the White House and Congress, that's sort of more broadly. It's also true among journalists. There was a time when you would write about China or talk about China in these competitive terms and people would look at you funny as though you you were somehow a, a misguided nationalist. And now everyone's beginning to realize, hey, wait a minute, this is actually strategically important for the U.S. That's exactly right. And not only that, uh, everyone sort of realized that the the undeniable uh, um, uh, interconnectedness of our two countries and our two societies uh, means that what happens in China no longer stays in China and that the actions and the strategy of the Chinese government is touching various parts of our life. And that was before the coronavirus. And, you know, when I talk about sort of Chinese influence operations and Chinese political interference on our soil, that's also a thing that only a few years ago, 
um, right. it was very hard to discuss because it's designed to be hard to discuss because it operates in that sort of gray area between straight soft power propaganda that we can see and uh, sort of uh, you know secret actions like espionage and theft. And in that middle zone are uh, th is this body of activity that the Chinese Communist Party is very uh, uh, serious about um, uh, perpetrating in countries all over the world, frankly. And uh, you know the the sort of public discussion of that uh, became a lot more robust over the course of the Trump administration, but also the discussion of China became so highly politicized during the Trump administration. Uh, and that's for a lot of reasons. And I think there's the Trump administration bears some responsibility for that, but not all the responsibility for that. And uh, that was really unfortunate because at the same moment that, you know, you had this debate in our research institutions, Confucius Institutes, 5G, you know, semiconductor, all of these very Wall Street investments, capital markets, all of these issues are very complex and have competing interests uh, and, you know, require tough choices and trade-offs. And, you know, when, when the issue got hyper-politicized, it became uh, very hard to sort of pick out the politics from the honest debate. And I think that's par part of what we need to do now. And I think we have an opportunity to do that now, both as a community in Washington, but also as a country is to sort of take a step back and say, okay, you know, US-China relations changed a lot over the last four years. They definitely got worse. You know, I put the lion's share of the blame on the CCP, but not all of it. Uh, but we are where we are. And, and, and uh, this is a challenge that now does touch all Americans and that, you know, every, and it, you, all you have to do is look at the polling and you can see that, you know, Democrats and Republicans are attuned to this issue uh, in every state of the union and politicians therefore are responding to that. And so that's, that, that's the broader awakening. It's not a bumper sticker. It's not a red pill thing. It's just a, a realization that, you know, uh, the, the, if we can, we can't sub object, we can't put the China issue as a subset of some other foreign policy issue that we care about. We have to get it right. And that means increasing our attention to it, increasing our resources to it. We can debate how to do that. And then widening the pool of people who are allowed to talk about it and who are allowed to comment on it and are allowed to write books about it, hopefully. And you know that, that is, in essence is an education that the media is also entering into in an imperfect way, frankly. But it's not that the media is deliberately trying to at least in my experience, put their finger on the scale one way or the other. They're uh, try ed being educated on the complexities of this issue in real time, just like the rest of us. You know, and, and as you mentioned, and, and as someone who served in the Trump administration, I, I, I'll back it up. Uh, this book is not an anti-Trump diatribe. Instead, it's a thoughtful analysis of various aspects, not just of the administration, but what happened under the administration's watch you know, you, you, you note that uh, traditionally, or, or maybe in popular media, there are two narratives about Donald Trump and China. One, which you say is more popular among the media, is that this neophyte president bumbled his way through the most important bilateral relationship in the world. And the other narrative, which is told by those closest to the president, is that quote, Trump actually had a firm view on China, an outlook that he brought into his presidency, and that has stayed consistent throughout. And your point is, they're both true. They're both perhaps a little bit inaccurate, but both are true. And the only way to really understand what's taken place is to look at both of them at the same time. Well, yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, first of all, you know, the, one of the first things I did when researching the book was I read all of Trump's previous books. There's a lot of them, over a dozen of them. Uh, whether you think he wrote them or not, they're, he, they're in his name. And a ton of them have a lot of stuff on China. And I just sort of you know, traced the, what, what I found to be a very consistent message. It wasn't exactly the same as Trump's message when he was president, but it, it, gave, us, it gave me at least a lot of clues as to how uh, President Trump thought about China. And, and, and it explained a lot about why you know, he was so concerned about trade and manufacturing and uh, economic imbalance and less concerned about human rights and et cetera. And, um, you know, I, I tend to believe that, you know, the confu a lot of the confusion over the public understanding of President Trump's China approach is because the president never made a keynote speech laying out what he, his theory of the case. It never happened. We had speeches from Pompeo and O'Brien and uh, Esper and, you know, Pence and everyone else. And, 
you know, the a lot of the confusion in the reporting was because a lot of the uh, uh, um, uh, reporting was based on an interpretation of Trump's uh, China uh, uh, views uh, filtered through his aides and was wrapped up in the in their competition. And you know what I describe is that sort of the this idea that there was sort of a a, a, a a blue team or a red team or panda huggers or panda sluggers or some other, you know, uh, you know, simple construction like that it just simply wasn't the case. What I witnessed were several factions and those factions formed what I call assorted alliances based on overlapping interests uh, that changed over time because of a lot of turnover. And at different times in the story, different factions uh, came together to push things that they wanted, but they didn't necessarily do that with Trump's knowledge or approval. And you know, that kind of complex dynamic uh, was hard to capture in the moment. Uh, but looking back and doing a, a few hundred extra interviews, I think I tried to get at it. And the basic story is that you know, uh, there was a lot of chaos. And while Trump, President Trump, in my view, had a firm view of China, he differed on the tactics. And he wandered through the different tactics presented to him with varying levels of intentionality in his uh, perceived close friendship with Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, significantly complicated the, the dynamic because it uh, played into the process in often unhelpful ways, especially during the coronavirus pandemic. And then there were a lot of outside voices and billionaires and friends and hangers on and relatives uh, who did their best to interject themselves into the US-China relationship. And, you know, for example, Jared Kushner, the president's son-in-law, was probably the most influential uh, advisor to the president on China, and he maintained a very low profile kind of uh, uh, activity, but it was hugely impactful. And he maintained his own ch channels to the senior Chinese leadership, but he wasn't a China expert either. His goal was to do what his father-in-law wanted, which was to get him a deal, you know, which they eventually did, although two days later the pandemic hit, so it didn't really last long. So that's a long way of saying that, you know, uh, I don't think it's fair to President Trump to say that he was, he didn't know what he was doing. I think it is fair to President Trump to say that his advisors often tried to work around him or trick him into doing the things that they wanted to do. Sometimes he caught it, sometimes he didn't. I do think uh, President Trump deserves criticism for abandoning some core American values like uh, standing up for the Uyghurs, standing up for Hong Kong. There were times that he didn't stand up for Taiwan. Uh, and if you can wrap your head around that kind of nuanced picture, I think you're gonna understand what happened in these four years without having to say that Trump got it completely wrong or Trump got it completely right, because neither of those narratives is really true. Just a reminder to everybody, we'll be taking Q&A from the audience, so use the chat function on, uh, on Zoom and, and submit your questions. Um, you know, it, it's interesting, Josh, you say that, um, and maybe this is a manifestation, again, of the unconventional president. So uh, maybe it's that all of us, particularly reporters who have a foreign policy portfolio wait for those those um, thematic long speeches that are given that set forth the Trump doctrine or the Biden doctrine or McCain doctrine vis-a-vis -vis the relationship with China and yet we had a president who would push things out on social media short messages shorthand and we everyone tries to interpret or perhaps they read into those postings exactly what they want to see or on the other hand, sometimes uh, what they fear. And so maybe that's part of the reason that we have these uncertainties uh, in, in the policy. Um, yeah, so I would just say, very please. quickly, I would just say that, you know, that wasn't a China-specific problem, right? Yeah. I mean, almost every issue uh, in the Trump presidency was, uh, uh, was, uh, was marred by this sort of confusion of Trump's Twitter feed versus what his officials were saying. And, you know, I just covered the China piece of it or the Asia piece of it. But, you know, that will surprise nobody in the audience that Trump's tweets complicated the work that his officials were doing. You know, when it, as it relates to China, I think the important takeaways are, are twofold. One is that the Chinese uh, government, the Chinese leadership misunderstood how the Trump administration worked and misunderstood Trump and, you know, really made a lot of big mistakes in dealing with the Trump administration. And the biggest one that I identified in the book is that if they had just given him a trade deal early on, they might have avoided a lot of the tougher on China measures that the hawks and the hardliners were able to push through once the president realized that his friendship with Xi Jinping was over. And 
you know, it, it, they listened to, they thought that the president was a businessman and he would make a deal and really that's what they wanted and it was fine. And they listened to their interlocutors who were telling them th that those things, a lot of the billionaires who were go-betweens. Uh, in the end, that view did not win the day. And perhaps the coronavirus pandemic is part of it, but it's also the fact that I think the Chinese leadership was very arrogant in the way that they viewed their ability to control uh, the Trump administration. And the second thing is that I think, you know, for our allies and partners in the region, it was really a kind of a sad story because I spent a lot of time traveling around with uh, um, senior officials, including Pence and O'Brien and uh, Esper. And these guys were all about alliance reassurance, right? And they were going to all of these countries around Asia. We went to, I mean, just, uh, just on my trip, we went to Thailand, Vietnam, the Philippines, South Korea, Japan, Singapore, you name it, Australia, Papua New Guinea. And every time we got to one of these countries, uh, it was plainly obvious that these countries were, were feeling uh, ignored and disrespected, and in some cases attacked with uh, you know, trade uh, measures or uh, basing dem cost demands or general neglect or benign neglect. And the missing alliance piece, I think, was something that a lot of people inside the administration uh, really lamented and tried to work at, but it, they weren't able to overcome the president's resistance to really fixing that problem. You know, and, and, and you you touch upon something that I wanted to get to. So uh, this book is not about COVID-19, right? It, right. It, it's about the, the grand strategic competition, as you put it. But inevitably, COVID-19 plays a role in that. Sure. And, and one thing that you write that I think uh, is absolutely accurate and is, um, is unfortunate uh, one theme that you lay out is that in many ways, uh, mainland China understood the possibilities of COVID-19 far better than we did in terms of diplomacy. And, and you refer to a written statement that came out from uh, Han Zhang, who was uh, head of the Chinese Academy of Scientists and the director of the Chinese Industrial Economics Association. And he said in a written statement, so it's not even you know, it, it's not even secondhand quoting, it's a written statement. He wrote, and this is in March, first week in March in 2020, it is possible to turn the crisis into an opportunity to increase the trust and dependence of all countries around the world of made in China. And that's what he said back on March 4th. And yet just weeks later, the response by the Trump administration was to suspend contributions to WHO and one month after that to leave WHO. And so if you're a, uh, a relatively poor country and you are at the mercy of Beijing, Berlin, Washington, D.C. to receive the vaccines that you know are the ultimate answer and you have those two messages, that creates not just uncertainty, but, but absolute fear that drive a reaction, right? Yeah, uh, exactly right. And, you know, I, on, on a 30,000 foot view, I, and I think the reporting bears this out, you know, it shows that China as the first country to confront the virus and deal with the virus and perhaps get through the virus had a huge first mover advantage, okay? And that combined with the power of its economy and its networks and the fact that they had all the PPE and the masks uh, put them in a position, as that quote notes, to really take advantage economically and politically and diplomatically. And, you know, let's for a moment say that that's, you know, that's what a country in that position has a right and an interest in doing. Uh, what's fascinating to me is that they actually squander that opportunity. And, you know, first, let's just look at the U.S.-China relationship. I mean, there was a lot of uh, mistakes made on the U.S. side, to be sure, and I'm not absolving our country of our handling of the pandemic, which I believe to have been awful. But, you know, the facts show that, you know, the Chinese government lied about the, 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 the virus. President Xi lied to President Trump about it multiple times, uh, saying it could uh, go away in the warm weather, saying it, herbal medicine would cure it, saying they had it under control when they didn't. They hid the science. They disappeared the scientists. Uh, they jailed journalists. Uh, for, we can get into the origin story, but they made it almost impossible to figure out how this thing started. We still don't know. That's a problem. And then they went around the world 
first with mass diplomacy to offer aid to countries, but then sooner or later, that mass diplomacy all turned into blackmail, including blackmailing the United States for critical PPE when our people were suffering. And the, 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 the threat was you better shut up about our handling of the virus or you're not gonna get your masks or you're not gonna get your PPE, et cetera. And of course, that wasn't just in America, that happened all over the world, Australia. Can you imagine gut punching the Australian economy in the middle of a pandemic for daring to not to toe the Chinese Communist Party line? That's what they did, okay? And that kind of uh, cruelty uh, actually backfired on and, and made a lot of countries, including in, especially in Europe and not just in Europe, sort of, again, wake up to the reality of what it is to deal with the CCP. And the fact that they were willing to do that, uh, in other words, put their political interests above their strategic interests and above the health and welfare of billions of human beings tells you all you need to know about what's going on inside the top leadership of the CCP. So I think that's like a, a, a long way of saying that, you know, uh, uh, the coronavirus pandemic brought to the fore a lot of the problems that a lot of people were already having with the Chinese government's behavior outside of its borders. And it forced people in every country to confront those problems in a way, in a new way. But more than that, it turned people in democracies, especially in democracies, against the Chinese leadership, forcing their leadership, their leadership in democracies to respond to that. And, you know, that has had all sorts of uh, second and third degree impacts, including uh, regarding uh, 5G, et cetera. Uh, so I think that the Beijing played this exactly wrong. And again, that doesn't absolve the United States for the mistakes that we made. And I tend to believe, and I'm guessing from your question, Ambassador, that you believe that we shouldn't have pulled away from the WHO because actually being involved would give us more leverage and not make us look like we were uh, uh, drawing back at a time that the world needed our leadership more than ever. Uh, so I think there's plenty of blame to go around. But you know, we, the world got to look at what a, a world order led by China looks like, and it wasn't pretty. Hey, Josh. Um, Mark uh, dropped off. Uh, he's just having some technical difficulties. Um, we, we, can, we have a couple questions from the uh, audience. I'll just uh, start okay. off with one. Let's do it. Um, Carl asks, is China an economic partner or a strategic economic threat? You know, I think that's a, it's a fair question, but I think that, uh, you know, any, any extreme description of the U.S.-China economic relationship is necessarily going to be off the mark. And I, you know, I, 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 when I report on sort of the Chinese Communist Party's strategy and its actions, especially its malign actions, what I get a lot back from, uh, you know, people on Twitter, but also even, you know, China hands is a lot of bumper stickers like, oh, it, or, or, is it a Cold War, uh, you know, Thucydides trap, you know, uh, you know are we decoupling? Is it, is this, you know, is it containment? And, you know, my, my argument in the book, which I try to make as often as possible, is that all of these bumper stickers are really imperfect and, you know, lead us to sort of get into our corners about, you know, oh, you know, which side of the China debate are you on? And it's really actually very unhelpful. So the answer to your question is uh, that it's somewhere in the middle that our, our essential interconnectedness in, in, uh, with China, especially economically, uh, is it, it will exist as long as our two countries uh, uh, continue on the search, which will be forever, right? We're not going away. We're not, globalization is not ending. And it's not realistic to have a strategy of complete decoupling with China, nor should it be desirable in any sense because it's gonna hurt people in both countries. At the same time, what we learned, especially during the pandemic is that our, the level of reliance we had on China for, especially in manufacturing, especially in critical, uh, in, uh, um, industries was too much because when the chips were down, they held that stuff over our head uh, to try to force us to uh, acquiesce to their political lines, which we just couldn't do. And right. real people suffered off of that and real people died off of that. Uh, and so some limited decoupling is not what we want. It's what we are forced to do. And I saw a lot of people, especially inside the Trump administration, who weren't for that in 2019, but by the end of 2020, we're like, oh yeah, now I get it. We have to make sure this doesn't happen again, and that's uh, so. So yes, China is a, will be the largest economy in the world, and you know it, the the goal is not to to separate our two economies. The goal is to find a relationship that we can both live with to avoid the conflict that neither side wants. 
And the premise of the book is that uh, the current you know, setup is not working, okay? And that somehow we have to, you know, first of all, strengthen our own systems, our own democracy, shore up our own security, prosperity, freedom, and public health. We can't model a system that we don't believe in, that we don't uphold, and we can't defend values that we don't live up to. At the same time, we have to speak clearly and be clear-eyed about the Chinese Communist Party's assault on those values and assault on those interests and then join with like-minded countries to come up with a comprehensive response. And that's, I, I think that's a mo moderate position. Some people don't think so, but I tend to think that's kind of where we all have to go. You know, Josh, we, we were in, uh, I'm back and sorry for falling away. No worries. Um, but in, in the epilogue, and I had mentioned, I think that the key to your book is understanding both the prologue and the epilogue and in between is what, what makes both clear. To me, the, the key moment or the key question that you raise in your epilogue is, is this, and I'm reading now, America can't out China, China, and it shouldn't try. The United States must avoid policies that disproportionately target Chinese and Chinese Americans who are not responsible for the actions of the Chinese government and also contribute greatly to American society. When it comes to liberal democratic values, America must lead by example and practice what it preaches. If the competition devolves into a race to the bottom, the free and open societies will lose. But in a race to the top, they will win. And so I guess the question for you after all of the research and all the observations that went into this book, which will it be? Oh, well, we don't know. I hope, I hope we'll win the competition and defend the values that we believe in. And I think we, we, we have to uh, devote ourselves to the task. And I think that's why I argue that this issue has to be at the top of our, not only our foreign policy agenda, but our agenda writ large as a country and as a society, actually. Um, you know, I, 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 I found it uh, horrible to watch as the uh, pandemic raged, the politicization of the China issue resulted in an increased, uh, huge increase in uh, hate and attacks on Asians and Asian Americans in our country. It's inexcusable. And it really, you know, for me, uh, brought to bear the, the risks and the dangers of using language when talking about China that can feed that kind of hate and attacks. And, you know, the president of the United States was using that language on the campaign trail. We have to speak bluntly and, 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 and we have to speak out every time we hear that language and, and condemn it because uh, that is not only a terrible thing to do to our Asian and Asian American uh, citizens and friends, uh, it's also the, the stupidest thing you could do in the China competition. And it feeds into the, uh, the CCP's uh, uh, propaganda that Americans are racist or that we're looking for another cold war, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, that's, I think, one of the things we have to fix right away. And, you know, as for the, the values piece, I think it's another uh, missed opportunity in the last four years was that the U.S., uh, the, the, the China's rise has been framed in most quarters and in most newspapers as a spat between the United States and China, right? right. Rather than an international response to China's government as it rises. And once you frame it as a, 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 a competition of values and a defense of the things that, you know, we believe in that are, are the, of the uh, back to the enlightenment, the, the rights of the individual, you know, not to get too sappy about it, but, you know, uh, <laughs> the, from, from, from Jefferson and Thomas Paine and, 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 and Spinoza and, and, and you, all the way up to the modern day, you have to believe that that is, represents progress in human society and that I believe that the Chinese Communist Party, uh, uh, the, way, the way that they treat the individual, not just the Uyghurs, but of course the people that they're actually committing atrocities against, but they're, uh, the, the, the basic premise that people are uh, the property and under the control right. of the state is terrible. And, we, and if you frame it that way, I think it's not America versus China, it's uh, free and open societies defending the things that we believe in and human dignity. Yeah, you know, it, it, I, I think one of the dangers for issues to be addressed during the campaign season, not just presidential, but really races all across the country, is I think the debate about China policy has really slipped into too much of a poking each other in the eye uh, exercise. And 
and, and maybe there's some fun and enjoyment and in, in, in strange uh, relief in that it just doesn't do anything to actually advance the ball down the field in the competition. I think you're right. You know, and, and so that none of the audience thinks that this is a book without uh, either heroes or progress or good things in, in the awakenings. One of the fun elements of the book is, is almost a la uh, World War II and the groups that work behind the scenes to actually take on the threat. You have a couple of uh, elements in the book. You refer to what's known as Bill's paper, when there isn't a bill, of course. Uh, and, and that was done so that it be, could be kept sort of secret as it was being developed. So talk a little bit about the, the Bill's paper. Sure, sure. So, you know, one of the, I think, most common tropes about the Trump administration's China approach, which I think is incorrect, by the way, is that they had no China strategy, right? You'll always hear that, oh, they didn't have a China strategy. Now, what I say in the book is that they actually had several, depending on who you talk to. And, you know, President Trump kind of sometimes wandered between them with various levels of intentionality. Um, but there's one thread throughout the story uh, that sort of brings you from day one to the very end. And on day one, uh, you know, then National Security Council Senior Director for Asia, Matthew Pottinger, uh, you know, walked into the White House and you know, gave his team a 12-page memo uh, that set out his view of how the U.S. <coughs> approach to Asia should be uh, changed and how it should be updated and how the U.S. should approach not just China, but the rest of the countries in the region. And he saved it on his computer, his bills paper, because he didn't want anyone to search it and find it and share it. Um, but that memo uh, became the basis or at one of the pieces of the, what later became the National uh, Security Strategy China section, which was uh, shaped a lot by National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster and his deputy Nadia Shadlow. Uh, it fed into a lot of the other secret reviews, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy review that was initially classified that then later parts of it were declassified a review on Chinese economic aggression, which was again, very hard to talk about in 2016, but all of a sudden in 2018, 2019, everyone's talking about it. Well, there's a reason for that. And what Pottinger was trying to do is he was trying to socialize these ideas inside the bureaucracy and connect the top level politics to the, the machine, the Washington machine, something that he knew about very well, both because he was a reporter and because he was uh, working at the DIA and was in, uh, uh, in the Marines. And, you know, it, with, with fits and starts, to be sure, eventually these ideas did survive and made it all the way to a U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy review that was released in 2020 uh, that was presented as the, uh, uh, the, the, the public explanation of the Trump administration's strategy. And, you know, you can look at it for yourself, but to boil it down, basically, it says that don't think of China as the sun. Think of it as Jupiter, one of the planets in a an important one in a solar system, but not the thing that we should center all of our uh, policy around and focus more on those frontline states in Asia uh, who are dealing with the China challenge <clears throat> first off. And then, you know, it called for a lot of specific things like uh, shoring up alliances and dealing with Chinese influence operations, uh, dealing with Wall Street, a lot of uh, interference operations, academia, semiconductors, all these things that later came out and that we now talk about pretty openly. Pottinger had them in Bill's paper on day one. So I thought it was a pretty interesting thing to talk about. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there is chaos under heaven and that's a lot of the externals, but on the inside, there actually were strategies underway. So you talk about Bill's paper and the other one that's even more perhaps uh, akin to some of the work done during World War II is the bingo club. So talk about the bingo club. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> So, uh, you know, again, early in 2017, things like Chinese influence operations were very difficult to talk about in public. They still are, uh, but now we have a, a, a body of work building about them. And again, these are sort of overt actions that conceal a covert purpose. In other words, when you look at a Confucius Institute, is that just an outpost of Chinese culture and language instruction? Or is that uh, a place where the Chinese intelligence service has placed collectors? Or is it just a a place where uh, uh, Beijing-friendly uh, scholars can work to thwart the Dalai Lama from coming to your college or you know, monitor Chinese students on campus. And the answer is sometimes it's one and sometimes it's the other and sometimes it's the other. And you know, 
because we it, we have to be very careful about making accusations that aren't warranted. I the 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 efforts inside the government to there first of all there was no place to discuss this kind of stuff, and so uh, someone uh, a friend of mine named uh, Peter Mattis, a former CIA analyst, uh, uh, created a, a, a salon, a, a private discussion group to to talk about it, and uh, I was part of that group and. It, there were some intelligence people, there were some Congress people, there were some National Security Council people, there were some scholars, there were some uh, foreign officials at times. And over the course of two or three years, it just became a forum for talking about Chinese influence and interference operations in a way that at that time, at least, you couldn't, there was no place in the government to do it and no public forum to do it. Uh, to be sure, over the years, many more institutions established programs to look at this very important and complicated issue. And nowadays, I mean, I could rattle off five or six think tanks that have very robust programs on this. But at that time and place, it was a very new and special thing. And uh, I just saw like a lot of people sort of get their heads together on this issue of Chinese influence operations. And essentially what it boiled down to was the Chinese Communist Party's United Front Network, which is, uh, you know, part of the Communist Party's overseas, but also internal efforts to, uh, as Mao Zedong put it, attack the party's enemies by using the party's friends. And it involves a lot of front organizations and a lot of money and the essential effort is to compromise elites in countries all over the world in order to have them promote Chinese interests and Chinese Communist Party political agendas uh, in American voices and launder them through American institutions. And there's just a ton of money uh, flowing around in it. And there are a lot of good reporters doing a lot of good work on this and that I could mention at this point. But suffice to say that in 2017, that bingo club uh, turned out to be the, the incubator for a lot of the things that we're saying about Chinese influence operations right now. So I thought I'd just tell the world about it. Well, and, and also something else that I think the average American uh, in the audience doesn't appreciate that there are a large number of important foreign policy thinkers that stay regardless of who's sitting in the White House, right? There actually is continuity in strategizing. So the, the right. bingo club was, is a way of responding to challenges and advancing it, and it carries through. And, and part of the importance here, and it gets to our first audience question, uh, Trump was in the White House during this time. This is not just a Trump book. This is also talking about where we go forward uh, and, and also President Biden. And, and the question I, I have here, uh, they write in, President Biden and Secretary Blinken have both said they are open to cooperation with China where it makes sense. So the question is, in what areas do you think it makes sense? Right, right. I, I mean, you know, again, I wrote that before the Biden administration came into power, but I think what we all see is that, uh, you know, the, a lot, is a lot of continuity in the Biden administration's approach to China. At the same time, a lot of caution. And uh, what I mean by that is that they haven't canceled a ton of the Trump administration initiatives, but they're very careful about endorsing them. And they're, they are taking a very strong look at all of them. And what we've seen is a lot of engagement with regional allies and very little engagement with the Chinese leadership, except on climate change in Iran, but that's maybe neither here nor there. And, uh, you know, inside the Biden uh, administration, there are different camps and they mimic the contests that we saw in the Obama administration between people who are more engagement focused and people who are more competition focused. And right now, the more competition focused people are winning the day. And uh, I think that's what you what you see in today's quad meeting and in the upcoming trip to Alaska. And that has given a lot of people, former Trump administration officials, I've talked to a lot of uh, confidence and actually uh, optimism that maybe the Biden administration could take what the Trump administration has done and build it and maybe even fix it, and make it better. And, you know, and maybe they could take the tariffs and use them as leverage rather than squander them as leverage. Maybe they could take our, 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 our multilateral approach and fix it and make it more multilateral and, and in, in fact, ha have a, a, a policy that's Trump-like, but much more successful. Uh, my personal view is that that's one way it could go, you know, and I don't think we know yet. And I think the competition uh, over China inside the Biden administration has yet to play out. And I think, you know, the bit, first big test will, when, will be when these competing interests like climate change 
and, uh, and, and other parts of the China competition clash. And then what's going to happen? Who's going to win that day? I don't think anybody knows. And, uh, you know, also, I wonder if China will actually be a priority in this administration, which doesn't really have many, any China hands in the top, top leadership and seems to be focusing a lot of that scarce senior level attention on things like Iran. Right. So, um, you know, it, it comes to another question, but we spoke earlier about how China perhaps uh, recognized the opportunity of COVID-19 before the U.S. did, or, or many U.S. officials did. And we talked about how they spoke of it as an opportunity, but there's also uh, aspects of the opportunity that are a little bit darker. Moves in the South China Sea, moves uh, against Hong Kong, and even moves on the border with India. Uh, the question is, uh, given what's happened, how, what is the opportunity or what are the best ways that Western powers and their allies can maintain freedom of navigation and can push back towards a rules-based uh, approach, particularly in the Asian theater, given what uh, has happened in the last couple of years from China? Yeah, uh, you know, again, I think the Chinese government's actions during the pandemic have actually uh, resulted in a backlash and, uh, you know, especially in places like India, uh, where, uh, you know, again, imperfect democracy to be sure, but a democracy nonetheless, the people there don't like it when Chinese troops pour over their border and they don't like being told uh, that they can or cannot say something about the Uyghurs or Hong Kong or whatever. And, uh, you know, so the, the, the trick is to find those like-minded countries and sit around the table and do the hard work of figuring out what it is we can do together. And I think that there, that that work is being done. Although uh, you know you, we could always do more of it. You know I tend to believe that, uh, and this is just my personal opinion, that a lot of the problem with uh, the regional coalescence around uh, um, finding strategies to to compete with uh, China is that the resources really haven't been there. And you know there's a a lot that the Trump administration did do, and you can talk about the development banks and all of that stuff, and that. That's all good as far as it goes. But when you're talking about a $3 trillion BRI initiative, not to mention all the stuff that they don't announce and just the basket of incentives and gifts that Beijing shows up with when they want uh, one of these countries to do what they want, um, you know, we need a lot more to compete with that than we put on the table. And, you know, that's not to say that like clean network citizens isn't a good idea and all that stuff, but it's, the, you know, where's the beef? You know what I mean? Right. Where's the money? Where's the, the real investment that would require trade-offs in other areas of U.S. Uh, foreign policy? And, you know, what, how can we marshal all of these economies to, to come up with new or at least reformed institutions that allow, that present a better case? In other words, we've got a lot of sticks. You know, we don't have a lot of carrots. And I think we need a, carrots and sticks. You know, and if push comes to shove, you can always hit people with carrots. Right. So, um, it, it, Josh, it's interesting. The wires have lit up as we've gotten into this aspect of, uh, of the discussion. So um, one question is actually related to what you've, you've just said. So th this person sends in, you know, it, on China not being the sun but Jupiter, what would it take for the NATO allies to have some semblance of a joint China policy? Right now, it's fragmented. What are the prospects for better joint cooperation? Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, that question pre-assumes that NATO has a big role in the China challenge. And I've heard people that argue that it should and people who argue that it shouldn't. And, you know, I don't necessarily have a, a firm view on that. It doesn't seem like that's what NATO was set up for. At the same time, it's an amazingly competent and powerful alliance. And it seems odd that it wouldn't be marshaled around the premier challenge of the day. So uh, I think there's some sort of nuance and middle ground that needs to be achieved there. But, you know, what I witnessed is sort of uh, over these four years is a lot of uh, disagreement inside the NATO countries, especially inside Europe, European countries, especially between inside Central and Eastern European countries about w whether the, the rise of China really is a threat and whether or not there is an uh, imperative to, you know, keep Huawei out of our sensitive networks and whether or not, right. you know, to allow Chinese investment uh, or to allow political concessions in exchange for access to the Chinese market. And, you know, if you're a small Eastern or Central European country, 
your calculations are very different than a very large Western uh, European country. And even if you're one of those Western European countries, your economy and therefore your political future as a leader may depend on, uh, you know, not pissing off the CCP. So, you know, I think, first of all, and again, these are just my, uh, my personal opinions, there's a risk of over militarizing this problem, you know, just because the only tool you have is a hammer doesn't mean that every problem is a nail. And, you know, I think most of the China competition is actually economic. And a lot of it is technology and some of it is ideological and political and people don't want like to hear that we're in an ideological battle. Some people think that we shouldn't make it an ideological battle. I write in the book that Xi Jinping has made it an ideological battle. We know this because he says it all the time and look at the amount of resources applied to the ideological battle on his end. So therefore that ship has kind of sailed. So, you know, if NATO has a role in, you know, uh, bringing together uh, the, uh, the countries in it, and focusing on this challenge, great. I'm all for that. Uh, but I don't think that the, the competition with China is going to be something that uh, NATO is necessarily going to be able to lead up. So our, our friend Michael Igo from DevX writes in. So just as it, you mentioned that, that um, there's going to be a, a rub or a clash when the Biden administration goes to take on uh, to advance on climate policy uh, necessarily in a different place than, than China. Similarly, with the Sustainable Development Goals, which were adopted by both China and the U.S. during the Obama administration, uh, getting to the SDGs requires an enormous amount of cooperation between the two. And what are the prospects for cooperation on those fronts, given where things are at right now in, in, the, in the debate and the conflict? Yeah, I mean, what you will hear Tony, Secretary of State Tony Blinken say every single time is that we need to cooperate with China where, where possible, compete with China where uh, 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 necessary and confront China, where, uh, whatever it is, whatever. It is. He's basically saying we need to walk and chew yeah. gum. And I think that that phrase is true and also kind of useless, right? Because it's a, it's a, it's a truism. Of course, we have to cooperate on things that we share. And of course, we have to compete on things where we disagree and confront on the worst behaviors. I don't think anyone's really disputing that, although some people attack that idea. Uh, the question has always been, how do we do that? And, ha and how do we manage that? And so just saying that we have to cooperate and compete and confront uh, is a nice line. It gets you out of that question in the hearing, but it doesn't tell us anything. And, you know, right. uh, you know, what that looks like, yeah. And for climate change, listen, you know, Secretary of State Blinken was asked in congressional testimony yesterday, I think, or the day before, are we going to give China any concessions in exchange for cooperation on climate change, which is what the Obama administration was accused of, rightly or wrongly, and he said no. Okay, so there's a realization inside the Biden administration that 2021 is not 2016, that some of the things that the Obama administration did in terms of making trade-offs dealing with China should not be repeated, must not be repeated. And I think that's their their. I, I give them credit for acknowledging that realization, but I still don't know what they're going to do about it. And I think that is largely because they don't know what they're going to do about it. And the the to to you know to say something nice about them, you know they've been handed this complex problem in a way that is it's much much more difficult than it might otherwise have been. So they're dealing with a lot of tough options. And once it gets to that level, uh, you're picking amongst a lot of. Uh, bad choices, but eventually they're going to have to pick. And, you know, the linkage, which is something that Trump often foolishly acceded to, like, oh, well, I remember one time it's in the book, he said, oh, well, you know, we'll give them a better trade deal if they help us on North Korea, right, after Mar-a-Lago. And, you know, I talked to officials who said, like, oh, my God, he just gave Xi Jinping a reason to never solve the North Korea problem. He gave him incentive to, to, to do nothing in North Korea because now he can Xi Jinping could dangle that North Korea thing over Trump as long as the trade concessions went on. And of course, that's exactly what he did. So I think delinking is generally good and avoiding the, the, this false idea that we have to choose between cooperation or competition is a, a truism, right? Uh, but it doesn't actually get you to where you need to be. Uh, we just have time for a couple more questions. Uh, one thoughtful question. Uh, what impact do you think President Trump's onshoring uh, policies and manufacturing, what impact is that likely to have? Yeah, well, I'm not familiar with the statistics. In other words, I don't know how much of that really materialized. So I, I, I'm going to 
not pretend to, to know things I don't know and say like, uh, you know, the return of manufacturing jobs, did it, did it really happen? Is it really happening? You know, um, I'll, I'll leave it to the, to the experts who follow that. But what I can say and what I uh, truly believe is that, you know, part of what was going on inside the administration, and I talk about this in the epilogue, is that those people who were pushing for limited decoupling structured the tariffs, uh, perhaps in a way to encourage that decoupling. In other words, by focusing on the, the high-end Chinese technologies and focusing on China made in 2025, et cetera, they were seeking, some people <laughs> were seeking to push China into the middle income trap where uh, the, the Chinese people would demand more salary uh, uh, than a low-end manufacturing would provide before their economy was de developed enough to support those laborers with high-end jobs. And in doing so, the hope was to throw sand into the Chinese economy and, uh, and grind it to a halt so that it wouldn't overtake us. Now, that's not the vision of the tariffs that you heard in public, and it wasn't the one that Trump was saying, but some people inside the system were thinking that way. And then when the pandemic hit, uh, those ideas, first of all, the trade deal happened. And, and the, again, a lot of people sort of misread the trade deal as insignificant because, oh, what's $50 billion worth of soybeans here or there? It doesn't really change much. And China's promises of intellectual property theft reform are probably definitely not going to be fulfilled. But to my mind, the real impact of the trade deal was that, that most of the tariffs remained. And this placed a permanent pain, a permanent cost on China's economy for all of the economic aggressions that they're on that are ongoing that they're guilty of and that pushes the decoupling more and it sort of makes american companies realize that the costs and risks of doing business in china are going up and then when the pandemic hit if you were a 3m and you were like called up your your factory manager in china you're like hey uh you know those million masks you've got in your warehouse yeah we're gonna need those why don't you send those over and the and the guy hangs up the phone and he says well you, you're gonna have to call the embassy and next thing you know you don't own, you, you realize you don't even own your own uh, factory. Right. Uh, well, that pushed a lot of the anti-decoupling people into the decoupling camp. And again, I'm not talking about total decoupling. That's a straw man argument. We're talking about, you know, figuring out what are the things that are critical that we need to have inside our borders in the case of another catastrophe, which will surely come. So uh, I'd like to end, end with this question. So Again, I think the book does a very good job of framing things, uh, prologue and epilogue, and talks about a number of, of trends that took place over the four years of the Trump administration. Some have said that one of the best things that we have going for us right now is that China may have tipped its hand too early, and perhaps they were forced into tipping their hand. Maybe some of this is is accentuated by the response to COVID-19, but you're, a, a constant theme in your book is one of awakenings. And the argument is that the US is finally awakened and perhaps China didn't want that to happen for a while. Well, that's right. I mean, you know, uh, if you- I mean, We're talking about, uh, you know, with your book, your book I think is a pretty thorough and in-depth analysis of the evolution in U.S. policy with China and talks about it in a number of contexts. And that is something that wouldn't have happened a few years ago, right? It, it right. Um, is not something that, that would have- I understand uh, your question perfectly. You know, what, what, what Pot, Matt Pottinger came to believe was that the Trump administration's unpredictable but very aggressive response to a lot of Chinese uh, activity, especially in that last year, uh, surprised Beijing and forced Xi Jinping to speed up his plans and to double down on a lot of these things in, or, in the recognition that uh, the jig was up and he had to uh, accomplish his goals uh, in a more uh, forceful way and in a, in a, in a, in a, in a quicker way. And that, that was, a, and Pondra believed that that was a, 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 a success, represented a success of the Trump administration's policy because it exposed Xi's gambit and forced him to react and his reaction because of a lot of things that are going on inside China could not have been to, you know, admit that he was wrong, right? There's the feedback mechanisms inside the Chinese leadership don't work that way. You can't be like, oh, Xi Jinping's like, oh yeah, you're right. You know, maybe we should just let the Uyghurs out. So, you know, that uh, some people do believe that that was a, a, a positive result of the Trump administration's policy. I think there's some merit to that. 
But I would just add that, you know, if the goal of the policy is to change the Chinese government's behavior uh, in a way that's actually makes it better, then, then we have to admit that that failed because, you know, none of the problems, the, none of the bad uh, actions and malign strategies got any better. In other words, it didn't work the way that we said we wanted it to work. The Chinese government didn't become a better uh, member of the international community and uh, the Chinese system didn't reform in any ways that are helpful either to the Chinese people or to us, quite the opposite. So again, the book is a call for uh, a, a balanced strategy that establishes a new uh, uh, relationship between China and the rest of the world that both sides can live with so that we can both avoid the conflict that neither side wants. And that involves uh, convincing the Chinese leadership necessarily that they have to stop some of these worst atrocities and practices that, that uh, you know, not just against their own people primarily, but against us. And they have, and China's rise is inevitable and it's not a bad thing. And we can't say that we don't want the Chinese people to run their own development. China's not gonna become like us. It's gonna develop based on its own history and its own culture and its own politics. Uh, and that's the way it should be. And we can't have this hubristic idea that we're gonna turn China into us. At the same time, China's rise cannot be allowed to come at the expense of our security, our health, our prosperity and our freedom. And that's what the response is. It's not about taking down China. It's not about a cold war. That's a bumper sticker. Don't let them tell you that. That's a false choice. It's about finding a balance of power that we can both live with so that we can have a, a, a world where we don't have the outcome that neither side wishes. Again, I, I think this is a book that comes to that question, that key moment in the epilogue in which you say, uh, you, you sort of boil it down, look, we can either have a race to the top or a race to the bottom. Race to the bottom, we lose. Race to the top is the best chance for the larger community to benefit. This isn't the Cold War. This isn't hard, hard power competition. This is about finding ways to uh, lift up things that we believe in, but in a way that allows uh, or recognizes the need for coexistence. China's exactly. not going away. Exactly. Time going away. I Josh, have said it Josh, you have written uh, a marvelous book, and I really mean that. I enjoyed every every part of it. It is uh, for someone who was kind of on the inside for some of these things. I can vouch kind for of. much of the accuracy, and uh, I, I'm delighted. And good luck, sub cabinet to you. official. You were way on the inside, and thank you for your service, Ambassador Green. Well, thank you, thank you, and thanks to everybody for tuning in uh, to the Authors and Insights series from the McCain Institute. Our guest has been Josh Rogan and his marvelous book, Chaos Under Heaven. Thanks, everyone, and take care. Thank you.